factors for gaining a nice apartment, a good income, children and friends. Thus we be one becomes entangled in this material world. Om Ajnana Timarandasya Gananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimati Roma Padaswami Tinamine Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swami Tinamine <coughs> Namaste Saraswati Deve Goravani Pracharine Nevishesha Sunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Adwaita Gadadhar Shiva Sadi Gora Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Vancha Kalpa Tarubhyas Chakripa Sindhubhya Eva Chak Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnebhyo Namo Namaha <coughs> <clears throat> I came to look at the commentary of um, <clears throat> Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur. Um, there's a book entitled um, Sarata Darshini, and he simply states the following. Um, this is his entire commentary on this particular verse. Digging up earth with the tips of his horns at the edge of the well, he produced a path by which she could get out. And <clears throat> that he goat refers to King Yayati, and the female goat is material happiness, um, represented by Devayani. In looking at this action that was performed um, by the he goat, <clears throat> Um, one can consider Lord Krishna's analysis, and um, this, is in, this analysis comes in the 18th chapter, in the 15th verse. So Krishna analyzes that there are um, five factors for action. Um, so the place of the action, the performer, the various senses, the many different kinds of endeavor, and ultimately the super soul. So the place of action is the body. So we have a goat with horns. And acting to bring about the results, um, <clears throat> he produced a path whereby the she goat could get out of the well, is actually the soul. The soul is actually considered the doer. So in effect, the soul knows <clears throat> He knows what the desired result is going to be and is also the doer. And it is by the senses that the soul is coming to act in various ways. So the, she, she, the he goat is engaging his senses in a material way because he's um, looking for some material enjoyment. So Srila Prabhupada's generalization is that all, the, all one's activities, including that of this particular goat here, are ultimately dependent on the will of the super soul. Because the super soul is situated within the heart as a friend. And um, <clears throat> the material nature of the goat's activities is highlighted because there's an adjective that's used to describe the he-goat, and that adjective that's used to describe him is lusty. Now, in the Bhagavad Gita, um, a commentary by Srila Baladev Vijibhusan, um, there's an dialogue between Arjuna and Krishna, where Arjuna asks the question, how would you describe this lust, this karma? And the response of Lord Krishna is very interesting because he says, it arises from the mode of rajas, so passion. So this then means that if one, this is Krishna continuing, if one can con conquer raja, gun, uh, by increase of sattva, meaning goodness, karma or passion can be conquered. 
And Krishna continues, one cannot extinguish it, meaning karma, by giving it what it wants. So this is Lord Krishna's response to uh, what is this lust. So, and Krishna's last statement, it is most voracious. Now the verse today that we're looking at, <clears throat> it seeks coming up is the explosive effect of giving lust, uh, which is coming from this mode of passion, what it wants. And in the case of the he goat, that explosive effect is his engagement in erotic activities. That's what's coming up. <laughs> so <clears throat> now if one considers the breakdown of qualities um, which allow one to distinguish between the different ways of being um, of particular persons, um, one can say that the quality of being very self-controlled is what distinguishes somebody <clears throat> um, whose way of being is in goodness. And while the quality of lustfulness distinguishes one whose way of being is in passion, while the quality of anger distinguishes someone whose way of being is in ignorance. And uh, this is um, uh, clearly um, explained actually in the 11th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam in the 25th chapter. So naturally, where there's increased self-control, lust can be overcome. And in the case of the he-goat, the antithesis comes to be exhibited. There isn't any self-control because he comes to engage in erotic affairs with other she-goats. So it's not restricted merely to the one that he pulled out of the well, but other ones too. Now, there's a further description by Lord Krishna of how one's functioning is affected by the manner of one's acting or doing things or of being. And I'm going to read the verse. Satvam rajas tama iti guna jivasya naiva me chita ya yaistu bhutanam sajamano nibadyate. This is again Srimad Bhagavatam 11th canto in the 25th chapter. So this is the translation. This is Krishna talking because um, he's going to describe how one's functioning actually gets affected by the manner in which one's acting, doing, or being. So the three modes of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance, influence the living entity, but not me. So naturally, Krishna can describe clearly because he's not influenced. Manifesting within his mind they induce the living entity to become attached to material bodies and other created objects. In this way, the living entity is bound up. Now, this is uh, Lord Krishna talking. And indeed, this comes to follow by the manner of acting of the he-goat, um, <clears throat> because it's coming from a passionate form, he indeed does become attached to another material body. And um, later on, I think coming up in the next verse, is describes that particular object that he's attached to is a she-goat with very nice hips. <laughs> That's the description. <laughs> so, now, <clears throat> since... Um, these uh, modes show themselves within the mind. <clears throat> the, you could say it's almost a prerequisite that the person is adopting a material mentality. There has to be a material mentality for the, these modes to be operating. Then the particular manner of being or the particular manner of acting shows itself within the sphere of authority of the mind. So here, with the goat, it's the willing aspect 
of a very passionate mind that shows itself in the usage of the points of his horns to engage in what Sher Prabhupada describes as a very laborious task. He's digging up the earth on the well's edge. Now, <clears throat> the attraction to another material body is made very specific by Srila Prabhupada in his purport. He says it's the attraction, and he <clears throat> uses it from the point of a man. The attraction is to a woman. And uh, this comes to act as a driving force um, for wanting to take on the management of um, a household. So that's the next part in the progression. And in King Yayati's case, this is described, <clears throat> and I'm going to read, although Maharaj Yayati was the king of the entire world and he engaged his mind and five senses in enjoying material possessions for 1,000 years, he was unable to be satisfied. So this is um, something of um, this driving force present in King Yayati. It was so great that for a thousand years he kept his mind attached to particular material objects. And so a prescription is given. If one understands that the contact of the senses with their objects inevitably agitates the mind, then the remedy is to restrict the senses, the material senses. And the effect of this is that the senses then get checked in their material activities and one becomes pacified. Uh, <clears throat> then one may remember Oh, sorry. Sometimes it happens that actually one is not actively engaging the senses with some material object, and one may even be residing in a very solitary place uh, where you know, there may not be that much exposure to sense objects, uh, but still one will be in a position where one will be remembering or even contemplating some sense gratifying experience. So even without exposure to the sense objects. And um, <clears throat> this kind of experience is um, due to having heard and having seen repeatedly um, <clears throat> something that one is finding oneself then even separated from the object contemplating it. Um, or remembering. So if one's restricting the senses from objects, um, for example, having some intimate connection with a woman, um, Srila Prabhupada writes that this will make the mind that's moving towards material objects, because that's the, the sense wants to go to the material objects, and particularly the mind, that movement starts to get a little sluggish. You know, the mind isn't so actively moving towards it. It sort of starts petering out. And this is then, um, the simile is used that it's just like a fire where you're not putting fuel in it. And it's going to die. That fire is going to die. So that movement of the mind from going sluggish, it's, you know, going to become stagnant. It's not going to move so, be so ready to move if one's restricting the senses. Uh, <clears throat> now, Chida Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he states that um, to free one's mental activities from this lust that's kind of polluting um, one's mental space, uh, he just gives the most elevated example. He says that one needs to worship the example of the liberated gopis of Vrindavan, um, who, and what is the distinguishing factor about the gopis is they accepted Krishna as their paramour. So this is the um, uh, 
means to free one's mental activities. So that acceptance of Krishna is one's paramour. And um, <clears throat> how this works is then described by Krishna. And he speaks of King Pururava. So we sometime back covered King Pururava and his connection with Urvasi. So Krishna uses King Pururava to explain how this actually works. Um, just worshipping this example of the gopis taking, Krish taking Krishna as their paramour. Um, he says, this is his, Krishna talking about King Pururava, his illusion got cleansed away by transcendental knowledge. He understood me to be the supreme soul within his heart, and so at last he achieved peace. So, <clears throat> and there's a similarity with King Yayati, uh, because he's also be, been described um, just right at the end of the um, previous section before King Yayati got the intelligence and this insight that he's able to relate this in a third party kind of manner to his wife. He's described as being without, this is the description, without material desires, Maharaj Yayati worshipped the Supreme Lord who's situated in everyone's heart as Narayan and is invisible to material eyes, although existing everywhere. Um, <clears throat> so again, it's this acceptance of Lord Krishna that is going to free up the mental space from this um, infiltration of lust. And there, there is in fact and this is going into just looking at something of the um, position of King Yayati and King Pururava. Um, if one's analyzing, there isn't any difference between a person who's a perfect yogi, who's engaged in meditation on the super soul, and somebody who's engaged in the loving service of Lord Krishna, because in the case of the person who's engaged in the loving service of Lord Krishna, um, externally he's engaged in many activities, but he is remaining situated in Krishna while he's been engaged in those many activities. So you can see that the common factor between the yogi who's meditating on the super soul within and the devotee who's is interacting supposedly with um, those objects, those material objects. <clears throat> the point is that he's always internally situated in Krishna. So there's not actually a difference between the two. Um, <clears throat> and this is like this because the person who's engaged in many activities um, just by concentrating his attention on the transcendental form of Lord Krishna, who's described, of course, as being beyond time and space, um, one becomes absorbed in thinking of Krishna. It's the freeing up of the mental space from even that voracious lust that can be there. And... Um, <clears throat> There's an example, this example that's given of the gopis who attach their minds um, <clears throat> to the transcendental form of Lord Krishna. Um, we read that um, Krishna was very expert in playing on his flute, so they're hearing, and they actually, their minds become captivated just by the sound because it's associated with Lord Krishna. And this vibration, the sound, is extremely attractive, not only to them, but actually to all the other creatures um, that are um, existing in Vrindavan. So one of the gopis comments on this. She says, um, the highest perfection of the eyes is to see Krishna and Balaram entering the forest and playing their flutes and tending the cows with their friends. Hmm. So this kind of absorption 
in all the activities of the senses in a particular object, and particularly Krishna. It's usually referred to as samadhi. And for the gopis, so this is Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur saying how one is actually fighting this lust. For the gopis, the pastimes of Krishna are the perfection of all meditation, all samadhi. So <clears throat> this um, is striking the death blow, like truly moving that uh, voracious lust out of the mental space is connected to um, placing one's mind at the lotus feet of Lord Krishna and particularly his transcendental form. So this was uh, a very short um, examination because I guess this purport was very short and these were some of the thoughts that emerged from examining this verse. If there's anything that um, can expand our discussion We were essentially mentioning that the yogi uh, is the same as, I think, a householder, and that um, a yogi meditates on the Lord within his heart, and even though the householder, uh, something to that extent, even though the householder are engaged with the sense object still, that doesn't mean they're disconnected from Krishna. Well, this, well the word yoga, when you use the word yogi, it brought to mind that uh, King Yati, he practiced yoga because he got sick of boga. <laughs> <laughs> Yoga means to uh, connect with Krishna, the all-attractive one, and Boga means to connect to Maya, the all-distractive one. Bogaishwaya prasatanam taya brahita cheta sam vyavisyamika buddhi samadau na And that verse from the Gita 244 says, um, one who is too attached to Boga and Aishwarya, uh, he's disconnected from, he can't connect to the Lord properly. And the one um, lesson I got from this is that I meditate on these points because I'm a writer, so I meditate on some of these points all the time, is that I remember working on my laptop, and um, it, all of a sudden it shut off. So I was like, what happened? Then I noticed that the charger wasn't plugged in. So then I really realized that that's a lesson we can learn, that to, as long as we're not connected to our power source, then we'll always be uh, distracted. We'll, uh, so that's one of the things, that, that's what makes appliances uh, attractive, is that they're connected to their power source, connected to our character. So my question is, is that sometimes uh, we may not always be able to plug into purity, <laughs> but how do we stay plugged into determination? Because <laughs> that's one uh, quality that's necessary to uh, maintain one's Christian consciousness. You may not always be able to, you know, reach the standard you want to. That may not be possible, but it's always, you know, possible to stay in Christian consciousness. And there's no verse in the scripture that says, Lee, if you're lusty and you feel like you're a hypocrite, leave Christian consciousness and go away forever. <laughs> so maybe you could explain how we stay plugged into determination. So, um, <clears throat> Jai Baladev was, um, <clears throat> Uh, particularly concerned to look at um, how determination remains there to continue with Krishna consciousness rather than perhaps acknowledging that uh, the lust is so great and let me step away from Krishna consciousness. Uh, <clears throat> so your question has implicit in it the um, assumption that uh, determination is uh, the important factor in um, continuing in Krishna consciousness. And indeed, um, <clears throat> uh, that is there. Um, <clears throat> so your question has to do with, you know, what fuels that determination to, to remain in Krishna consciousness as opposed to uh, giving in to lust. Well, <clears throat> everything has to be seen in relation to Krishna. So um, <clears throat> the, the lust 
starts getting fueled and burning furiously, um, as soon as, and you had pointed it out, as soon as one is actually claiming that object as a source uh, of enjoyment for oneself. So that kind of proprietorship uh, <clears throat> only serves to uh, you know, truly ignite this fire um, of lust because the, uh, it's the nature of lust, which was um, Krishna's description, that it's so voracious, it actually eats one up. So that claiming of an object only actually requires claiming of many more objects to um, try and find satiation because the fire is increased just by claiming something. So <clears throat> the, um, the satiation needs to come from... Um, truly not turning one's attention to feeding the um, <clears throat> lust or um, even getting beguiled for a moment and thinking that, you know, something is there for one's own um, um, pleasure. So... <clears throat> uh, the the ability to not get beguiled lies in, um, and this I didn't mention, but it's very much connected, what one is hearing and what one is seeing should be in relation to Lord Krishna or should be Krishna. So um, <clears throat> if one's hearing just the words of devotees around one, those words uh, can fuel determination to um, <clears throat> uh, see things in relation to Krishna. Um, and since the uh, focus on the transcendental form of Lord Krishna is uh, what will um, allay the um, shift to a material uh, mentality, it's absolutely essential to perform those activities that are enhancing and strengthening the um, uh, senses going towards the form of Lord Krishna. So, you know, coming to see the DT is um, uh, an, an extraordinarily uh, beneficial step in that direction. And um, if one's working with the computer and the internet, um, <clears throat> it's very easy, <laughs> it's very easy to um, be hearing and seeing everything that is going to fuel the lust. So, um, and then the mind actually um, will be remembering those images and remembering those words. So, you know, one's filling up one's mental space. So, truly, the best thing to do is not to expose oneself to that because then one leaves one's mental space clear. I mean, there isn't an alternative. I mean, because all of that gets taken in and imprinted. So <clears throat> with having a nice space that's at least one's not like overloading with sensorial auditory things that are of uh, you know, material nature, then again, one fills that space with the things that are going to uh, make more tangible the form of Lord Krishna within the mind. And uh, so words of devotees um, do that, and exposure to the deities do that, and if one is on the internet, 
practicing great restraint. <laughs> because uh, there's no doubt about it that um, it's a perfect way to fuel uh, the voracious monster within the mind and intelligence. Thank you. That reminds me, I just want to draw a comment. There was a, a topic from one devotee on the internet. They said we could connect to the internet or to the inner net, <laughs> oh. our inner net, our mm. super soul. Net, so. mm. Thank you, Harish. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Your play on words is quite expert, I will say. <laughs> There is a nice in nectar of devotion, nice uh, sloka is there. Prabhupada used to uh, recite very often that uh, Jena Tena, Jena Tena Prakarena, Krishna Manan nivas, Nivasat. Means by hook or cook, by any whatever means, you have to put your mind on Krishna all the times. <laughs> that is the <laughs> and also in Bhagavad Gita there is a nice verse I think quoted uh, what is there Sama Jipti Sama Jipto Tama Mata what is that and I mean see you who always think of Krishna is the best of yogi uh, thank you very much yogi nama pisar visa mad gatiran karan Salavan Bhajati Joman, Sami Jukta Tamamata. Thank you. Yeah, the thing. Ah, give it right to them. I'm thinking of the verse in the second chapter, Bhagavad Gita. Uh, the end of the second chapter it says that. Uh, like you, some uh, something along the lines of like desires coming in and out like river flowing into the ocean or something like that. Uh, there's also a verse in the 14th chapter that uh, makes me um, think of like how to deal with the modes of nature when they're acting upon you. It says like one who's not disturbed when there's ignorance or something like that. Or, or, um, it's like I'm just trying to kind of see the point like when the lust is within us like but not to act upon it it's like even though the desires are there and all this contamination is there if we just stay patient and stay calm and, and don't act upon it but uh, stick with the, the practice and, and cultivating our spiritual intelligence um, then um, we don't, in time, we're, it's, it's cleansed. It's a, it's a gradual process of, of cleansing. Whereas if we try to, like, all at once destroy the lust, like, in this moment, like, become completely purified now, it seems like uh, it could be difficult on the mind if we do that. Um, and it can be unrealistic and it can be unhealthy and uh, like whereas just tolerating it and, under and there's also the verse like just you know that eventually you'll be purified and by just sticking with the process so you're, you're peaceful you're calm just by sticking with the process so uh, just some thoughts maybe you can comment on <coughs> Um, so Giri Dari Prabhu was referring to a verse which uh, particularly points to the ease with which the mind is carried away. Uh, <clears throat> it's like a boat just going adrift. Um, <clears throat> and um, he was also uh, commenting on um, <clears throat> being able to remain peaceful even when the modes are operating by just reminding oneself that the process was one of cleansing and it was gradual. So just kind of adhering to the process um, <clears throat> of spiritual practices. Um, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> uh, 
the tendency for the mind to, um, you know, get wildly attracted to a material object um, is um, <clears throat> it's there, and if one is cautious. Um, one has to be cautious and very prudent in what one is exposing oneself to. So one doesn't feed it. Um, <clears throat> um, the, the greatest danger is not being cautious. Um, <clears throat> so one practices caution um, with you know, what one is hearing, uh, what one is uh, reading, um, uh, what one is seeing, uh, <clears throat> and that, um, that is uh, uh, automatically, you know, it's like that thing, the mind's, you know, wild movement towards the object, it's kind of tempered, just because of the caution one is practicing, you know, being very intelligent about what one is exposing oneself to. Um, <clears throat> that will, uh, you know, prevent the senses, you know, just uh, <clears throat> being left to run amok. I mean, one cannot allow that. And then um, the other part of, um, you know, acknowledging, okay, you know, perhaps the mode of ignorance is acting in the mind. Um, so <clears throat> that's usually characterized by, you know, wanting to sleep a lot. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, uh, one doesn't let uh, the external activities follow the dictates of the mind. So, uh, one tries to always regulate things. So, you know, if the mode of ignorance is pushing for an excess of um, rest, uh, <clears throat> one puts parameters on it. So again, you know, one practices caution. So one says, okay, I'm permitted to rest for 20 minutes, you know, and so one's very specific. One doesn't, you know, give an open, open rein to um, whatever, say if it's a mode of ignorance that's now present in the mind that's, you know, wanting rest and everything's just too hard and uh, I just can't do it. Uh, this can tomorrow, maybe the next day, maybe even next week. <laughs> one doesn't allow that. One actually performs the duty one has to perform, and tired or not, one does it. It's, uh, one can allocate some time for rest, but keeps it very controlled. Uh, because any new habit you create, it's, um, you become at the mercy of that new habit. Uh, <clears throat> because the mind likes the known thing. So if you create a habit that now you're going to sleep, you know, two hours in the day, the mind will demand it, you know, two hours a day. And so you've created a new habit and then it's very distressing and uh, such a disruption to bring things back in order. So, <clears throat> uh, and then in terms of knowing the process, well, the process um, of sp spiritual life is, um, always regulating everything and uh, having a beginning point and an end point. Um, <clears throat> one doesn't leave things open-ended. And, um, and then also in the spirit that this is an offering to Lord Krishna, each activity. So in that spirit, because you're thinking of Krishna, you are connecting, associating with him, uh, uh, his uh, presence is there in the mind. So uh, then one's automatically already uh, got the greatest ally in dealing with the mind um, and with whichever way of being is now this material energy that's beginning to act because somehow other one slid into material consciousness. Uh, <clears throat> you can uh, avoid it a lot by uh, just always remembering that whatever activity it is, even if it's a case of going for rest, to rest for 20 minutes, one actually treats it as an offering um, to Lord Krishna. One remembers Lord Krishna um, <clears throat> prior to taking that uh, rest because one thinks, okay, you know, for Lord Krishna, I'm actually going to um, 
allow the body to recuperate for this period of time so that I can with renewed energy pursue the rest of my activities. So one remembers Krishna always in everything so that it's um, uh, not a material activity anymore. It's actually a spiritualized activity. Even something that would appear like an ignorant thing. Um, you know, I've thought of the rest part because that's often how it's manifesting. So, yeah. So those are some thoughts. Thank you very much for your comment. I was just thinking of another aspect that you may be in a situation that you're trying to restrict the exposure of sens sensorial and auditorial things. But then there is also the element of the samskaras that one's bring from previous you know, times that are conditioning very, very strongly our you know, the propensities of the minds. And so it's almost like you have to contain a very wild, you know, powerful thing. And at times, you know, uh, it, 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 you may be caught in a, in a weak, you know, space, and that's when it can come out. Even if when it's sort of restricting, but then, then how do you, how do you help those situations, on dealing with the, with the conditioning that we once already, we, one, one comes to the process, of uh, control and restricting the mind with a, with a debilitating, condition. So it's like you're not. You know, on your full. How you say? Yeah, like that. Uh, a very interesting question that um, if one is looking at, you know, restricting the mind and senses, but um, due to <coughs> impressions in the mind, one's approaching the whole process already in a debilitated state. So how do you manage this? <laughs> so it's a very interesting question. Uh, <coughs> so... <coughs> Um, okay, in a debilitated state where there's already um, learned habits, uh, learned requirements of the mind um, <clears throat> for a certain amount of sensorial pleasure, you know, be it auditory or visual, um, <clears throat> and one actually knows one should be restricting that auditory or visual exposure. So uh, how do you do it when already those habits are there, already those needs are there for that amount of sensorial, visual, auditory pleasure? Uh, so this is a little painful. <laughs> uh, there's no doubt about it because um, any habit that's created is very painful to break. Uh, <clears throat> So one has to do it in small steps. Um, when I was uh, studying psychology, I used to like behavioral psychology. So it's an American way of viewing things, very pragmatic. So the American way of viewing things is um, <clears throat> there's a problem behavior. You then break down the behavior into steps. So. Um, <clears throat> Say, for instance, um, somebody has a phobia, and this was an odd phobia, but I remember it because it was so odd. It was in one of the psychology books. Somebody had a phobia that every time they were to turn, this person was to turn on a tap, there was this complete phobia that they were going to see, um, a, what's it, matzo flour, some flour that's used in Jewish preparations, that they were going to see a flood of matzo flour coming up. And one may think this is a very odd uh, association in the mind, but somehow for that person that was a source of great anxiety, this matzo flower, and somehow turning on a tap was associated with it. So this is in the psychology books. So, uh, 
then the behavioral, the um, behavioral, the psychological behavioral method of dealing with that was to, you know, break that pattern in the mind. So they would first get the person to stand at the door of the kitchen and the taps in the distance. You're just viewing the tap. Then, you know, the person had to be able to take two steps towards the tap. And then the person was finally coming right up to the tap. And so, you know, with somebody with a phobia, this is a huge thing to actually have to confront because the patterns in the mind, there's already association in the mind. And uh, <clears throat> um, through breakdown, eventually the person's even able to turn on the tap and, you know, stand there for one second and then, you know, two minutes and so on. So the psychologist breaks the habit in the mind through uh, a kind of um, gradually changing the perception of the dangerous object. So in the same way, if one is um, <clears throat> accustomed to a particular habit, one goes in one's mind always to a certain place in the mind, or one needs to externally get what the mind needs. There's a habit to go to a particular object or a particular place for some auditory or visual pleasure. So a similar kind of principle would apply that um, one starts to take certain steps to ch break the habit. So if the mind always goes, let's first deal with it internally, if the mind always goes to a favorite place for the pleasure, one has to now introduce something else in that space that changes what's there. So um, like Giri Dari's question, um, you know, one's actually, uh, since the antithesis or, or, or to, the remedy has to do with um, the form of Lord Krishna, then it would make sense when the mind goes there, one brings into the mind the form of Lord Krishna simultaneously. So, you know, one's not at the mercy anymore of that particular thing in the mind that one looks for for pleasure. So the minute one brings Krishna there, it's like you, you're applying the remedy. So one keeps doing that. So, you know, as opposed to then you know, going down a whole long path of whatever that old source of pleasure was, you know, you've now put in a new element and the remedy element, which is Krishna, so <clears throat> you're changing things. And uh, one just keeps doing that. You know, you're changing it. So if it's an external looking for um, the pleasure externally, then it again has to be done gradually. One may not be able to cut down, uh, you know, a two-hour exposure to... Um, a movie or a two-hour exposure to internet games or I don't know what it may be, but let's say I don't know, I'm uh, giving some hypothetical things. So one has to then start cutting down. So then one has little control of that, perhaps. So then um, one has to actually ask somebody externally to help one to... Um, you know, please come and check on one that, you know, that one's physically taken away from the computer after an hour and 40 minutes as opposed to an hour and 50 minutes. So one starts restricting it and one does it very gradually because it's painful changing a habit and breaking a habit. But <clears throat> that's just the sort of mechanical way of doing it. But the better way of doing it <clears throat> is, again, something in connection with Krishna that you can balance it with. So... If it is the uh, movie thing, then, uh, you know, watching Ramayan is certainly going to uh, be applying the remedy for that need for the external continuous visual, visual stimulation for a two-hour period. You're then watching Ramayan, you're, you're applying the remedy, you introduce Krishna. <laughs> so the, the remedy has been applied with the same activity. But if one finds that one can't apply the remedy because the other still seems more attractive, uh, then one just has to start restricting in terms of time 
and exposure and may need the help of somebody else to um, you know, physically remove one from, <laughs> from the computer. <laughs> Um, yeah, so anyway, applying the remedy. Um, I'll tell you from personal experience what uh, has worked for me. Uh, <clears throat> um, for a long time, I used to, you know, have a sort of little regulated time where, you know, it was like, okay, this was the time frame in which I could actually shop for whatever object it was that I needed to shop for. So. I would always approach it with some fear because I know that all those images are going to be imprinted. I'm going to be, walk I'm going to be chanting and then images of whatever it is. Um, uh, let's say it's, um, I don't know, a sari, let's say. I'm going to have a stream of images while I'm chanting of different colored saris appearing and I think, oh no. And then, you know, the intelligence goes, should it be this color or that color? And then, you know, that pattern works better, and, that, you know, that will coordinate with that in the wardrobe. You know, so, I mean, I'm just giving a, some sort of example of how it goes. So, um, <clears throat> anyway, um, it seemed a very, um, you know, controlled activity because it was restricted by time, but I, definitely the um, space in the mind and the last part was being fueled. I mean, even if it was a necessary thing, the lust was being fueled without a doubt. And I used to always feel very concerned about it, thinking, how, you know, how do you stop this? You know, you have to do some things, but the lust is getting fueled. Like, you know, which one is it going to be? How many? When? Oh, now I need to get it. Now it's really important to get it. You know, it fuels the lust. So <clears throat> anyway, what helped tremendously was going on the yatra. When I went on the yatra, uh, <clears throat> uh, one thing that uh, had a profound effect on me was visiting the uh, places of pastimes of Lord Ramachandra. And because each of the places are completely saturated in um, this, and the mood there is actually grief, but it was transcendental grief. Um, <clears throat> it was so profound, just being in an entire environment with you know, a transcendental emotion, that it left such a huge impression on my mind. So I found when I returned, I actually thought I have no desire to even go near the computer, even for that allocated, regulated little sensorial thing. It, it seemed so, it couldn't compare anymore. So now I, I truly actually, I feel I've given it up. It doesn't matter to me anymore because all I remember is being immersed in this atmosphere of this um, a shock, this transcendental grief that um, was the atmosphere of all these places of Lord Ramachandra's pastimes. And I just remember that and the other is irrelevant. What pleasure could I possibly get out of that? So anyway, that's what worked for me recently. I'm just sharing. Um, so again, you apply the remedy in the way that it works for you. In my case, it worked the, um, you know, the saturation of the emotion, the spiritual emotion within the mind. Uh, it was no longer necessary for me to try and find some dull pleasure. So anyway, thank you very much uh, for your very, very kind attention for this uh, somewhat shorter class because of the very short purport. Thank you. All glories to Prabhupada, all glories to Srimad Bhagavatam.